Let's get right into it, asterisk number eight. The monster study, asterisk, imagined being an orphan in 1939. Imagine a couple of friendly university researchers show up and decide to use you as their personal guinea pig. That's exactly what happened to 22 children at the Iowa Soldiers Orphans Home. A psychologist named Wendell Johnson, who ironically had a stutter himself, wanted to prove that stuttering was a learned behavior, not a genetic flaw. His theory was that you could literally talk someone into stuttering. So he and his graduate student, Mary Tudor, divided the unsuspecting orphans into two groups. Half the kids who already had speech impediments were showered with praise, told their speech was fine, and given positive reinforcement. The other half, who were perfectly fluent speakers, were told the exact opposite. Tudor relentlessly criticized them, telling them their speech was not normal, that they were beginning to stutter, and that they should never speak unless they could do it right. The results were as predictable as they were monstrous. The children who received positive feedback became more confident, while the fluent kids who were told they had a problem developed one. They became withdrawn, anxious, and started to exhibit the very stuttering behaviors the researchers were looking for. They grew hesitant to speak, embarrassed by interruptions they never had before. The experiment didn't just give them a speech impediment, it crushed their self-esteem. The study was so obviously cruel that Johnson's own colleagues secretly nicknamed it the monster study. He never even published the results, probably because he knew it would tank his career. For their trouble, the surviving orphans later sued the state of Iowa and won a settlement for the lifelong psychological damage they endured. Basically, Johnson proved his hypothesis. But the only thing he really taught the world is that if you tell a child they're broken, they'll believe you. Number seven, the landest facial expressions experiment ever. Wonder if your face does the same weird scrunchy thing as everyone else's when you smell something gross. In 1924, a psychology graduate student named Carney Landis decided to find out. He wanted to know if all humans share universal facial expressions for emotions like joy, shock, and disgust. It's a decent question, but his methods were questionable. He gathered a group of students, drew black lines on their faces to track their muscle movements, and then proceeded to throw a series of increasingly bizarre situations at them. First, it was pretty tame stuff. Smell some ammonia, listen to jazz music. But when that didn't produce the dramatic reactions he wanted, Landis escalated things. He made them look at pornography, put their hands into a bucket of live frogs, and even set off firecrackers under their chairs. But the grand finale was the real kicker. Landis brought out a live rat and told the participant to decapitate it with a knife. Unsurprisingly, most people were horrified and refused. But here's the truly messed up part. Two-thirds of the participants, after some prodding, actually did it. These were ordinary students with no training in how to humanely dispatch a rodent, resulting in a prolonged and gruesome ordeal for the poor animal. And for the one-third who held their ground and refused, Landis would just grab the knife and do it himself right in front of them. After all that, the conclusion was a total bust. It turns out people make all sorts of different faces for the same emotion. The only thing Landis really proved was that a guy in a lab coat can convince a shocking number of people to do something truly awful. So, next time you see a weird stock photo of someone making a pained face, just be glad you weren't in Landis's lab. Number 6. The Pit of Despairif You thought the monster study was bad. Buckle up, because we're about to visit the work of Harry Harlow a man who dedicated his life to proving that love is real by using methods that were completely devoid of it. In the 1970s, Harlow wanted to study depression. But since he couldn't exactly give a rhesus monkey a tiny therapist and a prescription for Zoloft, he decided to create depression from scratch. His solution was a device he cheerfully named the Pit of Despair. This wasn't some metaphorical pit. It was a literal one. Harlow built a steep-sided stainless steel chamber with a wire mesh floor. Baby monkeys were placed inside alone for up to 10 weeks. They had food and water, but zero contact, zero comfort, and zero stimulation. The chamber was designed to be the most soul-crushing environment imaginable. The monkeys would spend their first few days trying to climb the slippery walls, only to fall back down again and again. Eventually, they just gave up. They'd huddle in a corner, rocking back and forth utterly detached from the world. When they were finally let out, they were, to put it mildly, ruined. 
They were socially inept, emotionally vacant, and terrified of everything. They wouldn't play with other monkeys, and many refused to eat, starving themselves to death. Harlow's conclusion that even a short period of total isolation could cause profound and persistent psychological damage. It was a groundbreaking discovery that helped us understand the importance of social bonds. But it came at the cost of systematically breaking the minds of helpless animals. He basically invented a torture chamber to prove that being tortured is bad for you. Thanks, science. Number five, the John Joan case. This one isn't a formal experiment, but it's a case study so infamous it changed the way we think about gender identity forever. It all started in 1965 with a baby boy named David Reimer. After a botched circumcision destroyed his penis, his parents were desperate. They turned to a psychologist named Dr. John Money, who had a radical theory. Gender identity was entirely learned. He believed you could raise a boy as a girl, and as long as you were consistent, everything would be fine. He saw David as the perfect tragic opportunity to prove his point. So, at Money's urging, David's parents agreed to raise him as a girl named Brenda. He underwent castration and was given female hormones. Money published glowing reports about the case, hailing it as a massive success. He claimed Brenda was a happy, well-adjusted little girl who loved dresses and hated getting dirty. It was the ultimate proof that nurture, not nature, determined who we are. Except it was all a lie. Brenda was miserable. From a young age, she rejected dolls, ripped off her dresses, and tried to pee standing up. She was bullied relentlessly at school and felt profoundly out of place in her own body. Money ignored all of this, dismissing it as a phase and pressuring the family to continue the charade. Finally, when Brenda was 14 and threatening suicide, her parents told her the truth. The relief was immediate. Brenda instantly decided to live as a man. Taking the name David, he underwent surgeries to reverse the process, got married, and became a stepfather. But the psychological trauma was too deep. After years of struggling with depression, David Reimer took his own life at the age of 38. The case was a catastrophic failure that proved the exact opposite of Money's theory. Gender identity is an innate, biological reality, not a blank slate you can write on. Number 4. The Milgram Experiment How far would you go for science? Would you shock a complete stranger just because a guy in a lab coat told you to? In 1961, Yale psychologist Stanley Milgram decided to find out, and the answer was, frankly, disturbing. Milgram wanted to understand how ordinary people could participate in atrocities like the Holocaust. His theory was that people are surprisingly willing to obey authority, even when it goes against their own conscience. The setup was simple but ingenious. Participants were told they were part of a study on memory and learning. They were assigned the role of teacher, while another person, an actor, was the learner. The teacher's job was to read word pairs to the learner. And if the learner got one wrong, the teacher had to deliver an electric shock. The shock generator had a series of switches, starting at a mild 15 volts and going all the way up to a bone-rattling 450 volts. Labeled 30, of course, the shocks weren't real. But the teacher didn't know that. The actor would grunt in pain, then shout, then complain about his heart condition, and eventually fall silent, as if he'd passed out, or worse. If the teacher hesitated, the experimenter, a stern man in a gray coat, would calmly say things like, please continue, or the experiment requires that you continue. Before he started, Milgram polled his colleagues. They predicted that only a tiny fraction of people, the most sadistic among us, would go all the way to 450 volts. They were wrong. A staggering 65% of participants followed the orders and delivered the maximum shock. They weren't happy about it, they sweated, trembled, and pleaded to stop but when the authority figure insisted, they complied. The experiment revealed a dark truth about human nature. We have a deep-seated obedience to authority that can easily override our moral compass. Basically, your inner just following orders voice is a lot louder than you think. Number 3. The Stanford Prison Experiment, Peaking of Ordinary People Doing Terrible Things Let's talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment. In 1971, psychologist Philip Zimbardo set out to answer a simple question. Are prisons violent because they're filled with violent people? Or do the prisons themselves make people violent? He converted the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building into a mock prison. 
rounded up 24 mentally healthy college students and randomly assigned them to be either prisoners or guards. The experiment was supposed to last two weeks. It didn't even make it to six days. The guards were given uniforms, wooden batons, and mirrored sunglasses to create a sense of anonymity. The prisoners were arrested at their homes by real police, stripped, deloused, and given numbered smocks to wear. Within hours, the roles started to feel a little too real. The guards, who were just regular students a day earlier, became sadistic and authoritarian. They subjected the prisoners to humiliating punishments, like forcing them to do push-ups with a guard's foot on their back or cleaning toilets with their bare hands. They used sleep deprivation, solitary confinement, a tiny closet, and psychological manipulation to maintain control. The prisoners, in turn, became passive, helpless, and emotionally broken. Some had full-blown mental breakdowns. The situation spiraled out of control so quickly that Zimbardo, who was acting as the prison superintendent, lost his own objectivity. It took an outside observer, his then-girlfriend and future wife, to point out the obvious. He was running a chamber of horrors. The experiment was shut down immediately. Zimbardo proved his point with terrifying clarity. Put good people in an evil place, and the place will win. It showed that the power of a situation can be so overwhelming that it can make monsters and victims out of anyone. Number 2. Little Albert Before There Was the Monster Study There was Little Albert? In 1920, behaviorist John B. Watson wanted to prove that all human emotions were just conditioned responses. He believed that fear, love, and anger weren't innate, they were learned. And what better way to prove that than by teaching a baby to be afraid of something completely harmless? His subject was a nine-month-old infant known to history as Little Albert. Albert was, by all accounts, a chill baby. He was stable, calm, and rarely cried. Watson started by showing him a variety of objects. A white rat, a rabbit, a dog, a monkey, and some masks. Albert was curious, but unafraid. He even tried to play with the rat. Then, the experiment began. Every time Albert reached for the fluffy white rat, Watson would sneak up behind him and smash a steel bar with a hammer. The loud, sudden noise terrified Albert, making him burst into tears. They repeated this over and over. Rat, bang, rat, bang. Soon, just the sight of the rat was enough to make Albert cry and crawl away in terror. Watson had successfully conditioned a phobia into a child, but he didn't stop there. He found that Albert's fear had generalized. The baby was now terrified of anything white and fluffy. The rabbit, a fur coat, a Santa Claus mask, and even Watson's own white hair. He had taken a perfectly happy baby and systematically installed a panic button in his brain. The worst part, Watson and his team never deconditioned him. They never taught him not to be afraid. Albert's mother moved away before they could. So for all we know, he grew up with a lifelong inexplicable terror of fuzzy things. The experiment is a landmark in psychology, but it's also a masterclass in how to be a terrible person in the name of science. Number 1. The Tuskegee Syphilis Study This wasn't just an experiment. It was a 40-year betrayal. In 1932, the U.S. Public Health Service launched a study to observe the natural progression of untreated syphilis. The subjects were 600 impoverished African-American men in Macon County, Alabama. Of these men, 399 had syphilis and 201 did not. They were told they were being treated for bad blood, a vague term used to describe a variety of ailments. They weren't just lied to, they were bribed. The researchers offered them free medical exams, free meals, and burial insurance in exchange for their participation. And, most damningly, they were never given treatment. Even in the 1940s, when penicillin became the standard, life-saving cure for the disease, the researchers actively withheld it from them. They wanted to see what would happen if the disease was left to run its course. They watched as the men suffered from the devastating effects. Blindness, deafness, insanity, heart disease, and eventually, death. They went to great lengths to prevent the men from getting treatment elsewhere, even providing local doctors with a list of their subjects and telling them not to treat them. This went on for four decades. It only ended in 1972 when an Associated Press reporter exposed the story sparking a massive public outcry. By then, 28 of the original men had died directly from syphilis. 100 more had died from related complications. And at least 40% of their wives had been infected. 
passing the disease on to 19 of their children at birth. The Tuskegee study is arguably the most infamous biomedical research study in U.S. history. It didn't just break a few ethical rules, it shattered the very foundation of trust between doctors and patients and led to massive reforms in research ethics. It stands as a horrifying monument to what happens when scientific curiosity is combined with a complete and utter disregard for human life. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.